Are you ready for your next great Civil War read? Then try the new historical novel, The Heavens Falling, by Jonathan Lucci. Follow the members of the Dawson family through the Civil War, from the halls of Congress to the bloody fields of battle, and from the decks of gunboats to the solitude of Lincoln's office. The Heavens Falling is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle, or visit theheavensfalling.com to order. That's theheavensfalling.com. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott, narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. While in Gettysburg, make sure you visit the Gettysburg Museum of History, located right in the heart of Gettysburg at 219 Baltimore Street. Admission is free. This museum has over 4,000 unique artifacts on display spanning from the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and much, much more. Be sure to stop by Wednesday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. You won't want to miss it. That's the Gettysburg Museum of History, 219 Baltimore Street. It's a must-see on your next trip to Gettysburg. This is Dan Casella from the No Pollution of Cowardice South Jersey in the Civil War podcast, and you are listening to Addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And uh, today we are talking about Abno Pewin's Brigade. (laughs) Uh, with uh, our friend uh, Louis Trapp. But we also have uh, uh, another guest with us who's who's not a guide, but uh, an author. Yes. Yes, okay. And uh, and uh, his name is uh, Ben Quina. Ben, welcome to Addressing Gettysburg. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am a 42-year-old. I'm an attorney in Grand Ledge, Michigan, and a father of a 10-year-old son. Been practicing law for about fifteen years. What kind of law, general civil practice. Um, you know, general practice, small town. Uh-huh. Uh, been interested in the Civil War since I was, you know, ten, nine, ten years old. Came out here to Gettysburg in the early nineties. My parents were, you know, very supportive of that endeavor. And uh, sure. So uh, yeah, I've been just eating this stuff up since I was a kid. And uh, big uh, Michigan State fan. Went to college there and law school and uh, started my own practice in Michigan about 15, 16 years ago. And, and so you wrote, uh, you wrote or you're writing a book on Parents Brigade? I have completed a regimental history of the 12th South Carolina Regiment gotcha. in, in Perrin, which is McGowan's Brigade here at Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, But there are a lot of facets of the entire brigade in, in that book because they were brigaded together with the 12th. Sure. Uh, and then, uh, so when is that? Is that out or is that? It is slated to be published uh, about a year from now uh, with Savas Beatty. Okay. So 2024 uh, sometime. Yes. Yep. Uh, very good. Very good. So we're going to uh, get into this. Uh, and of course, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to uh, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, and if you ever want to uh, participate in an Ask a Guide, you have to be a patron over at patreon.com. So go ahead. While you're listening to this, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, become a patron, and there might be uh, a call for questions waiting for you there. And uh, you can uh, submit questions on a future episode. All right. So Pewin's Brigade. Lewis, uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, uh, and Ben, you feel Feel free to jump in at any point. Sure. Um, so Powin's brigade. You mentioned McGowan. Um, and McGowan was the uh, the commander prior to uh, Powin. Yes. Uh, and and he was what wounded at Chancellorsville. He gets wounded. So Abner Perrin is the ranking colonel, mm-hmm. and he gets moved up into command, and he's going to command the brigade here at Gettysburg. They have a little over eighteen hundred men, five regiments. Um, they have the first South Carolina provisional. First Carolina Rifles, which is also known as Orr's Rifles. Um, then the 12th, 13th, and 14th South Carolina Regiments. 
Provisional. What does that mean? Provisional army. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the questions. There was the difference between them and the Orr's rifles. So, so it must be, let's see, uh, was the provisional army the, the first thing that uh, the Confederacy put together before they were actually able to formalize everything, like at the early yeah. stages? The first provisional is put together right after, or shortly thereafter, South Carolina secedes from the Union. Right. Okay. And so they are a six month regiment. So their term's going to expire, I think, in June or July 1861. And so um, provisional is temporary. They're a temporary regiment. And then they, when that term of service uh, expires, most of the regiment re-ups and they form, they stay within this first, and they continue with the name first provisional, even though they're mustered in the Confederate Army. Um, they just keep provisional, I think, is the distinction they were there first, um, but then you had this other first. It's Orr's Rifles. Um, this fellow named Orr got together a regiment and called themselves Orr's Rifles, even though they had muskets. Um, <laughs> but that's the other first South Carolina. There was also Hagwood's Rifles, first Hagwood's yep. Rifles, and I think first uh, Butler, which was a, started off as a heavy artillery unit and then transitioned to infantry at some point or you know, so, not, they're so not here. You're saying there's more than two firsts? Well, there's a lot of firsts. <laughs> yes, that's, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, but wow. that's the difference between provisional means temporary, and that was a six month unit, and then most of that regiment re ups. They become a permanent regiment, but they just keep the uh, the title first provisional. And, and they're under the command of uh, Maxi Gregg at the beginning yeah. of the war, who ends up becoming uh, the brigade commander of this South Carolina brigade when they all go north um, into Virginia for the 62 campaign. Yeah. Right. And then wh uh, what happens with Greg? How, how is he not? He's, is he not the commander at Chancellorsville, obviously? Cause he's sort of dead. Is, yep. He's dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he gets killed. <laughs> okay. So this brigade, basically, um, the 12th, 13th, and 14th are stationed down in the low country of South Carolina um, for the first, um, pr probably from like October of 61, to um, April of 62. First rifles and the first provisional, I believe, are already up there in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is um, uh, around April of 62, the 12th, 13th, and 14th are shipped up to Virginia Theater of Operations with Greg in command of this brigade. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, they're shipped up there and then they are consolidated with the first and the first rifles put under command of Maxie Gregg, and that becomes the brigade, which will become the brigade for the rest of the war. Okay. So uh, between Chancellorsville and here, what goes on with them? Anything exciting? Well, besides marching up here, lots. Uh, McGowan gets wounded, and so Abner Perrin is going to move up and take command. Um, and he was previously commanded of 14th. I think yep. it's 14th South Carolina. Yep. So uh, he moves up. That's and then Lee does the reorg of his army, creates two different, two new corps, and Parents Brigade is now known as Parents Brigade is going to be put under um, the division of Dorsey Pender, which is under Corps Commander A. P. Hill. They had fought under A. P. Hill prior to this, so there's familiarity there. Um, and then they're going to make their way up here. Um, to Gettysburg, eventually to Gettysburg, make their way up into Pennsylvania. So, anything you want to add to the, the trip up? That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean they were they were some of the last people to leave the Rappahannock Rapidan yeah. line down in Virginia. It's Hill's course, yeah, you know, they're trying to hold the uh, Union Army in place. Right. We should mention they're in uh, Penner's division of Hill's Corps. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Which is the old Light Division, which basically used to be a six brigade division, a huge division in mm. the army. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take um, Heath's brigade and Archer's Brigade, and they're going to peel them off from that division and create a new division for Harry Heath before the invasion. And then the four brigades that are going to be left in Pender's division is going to be um, Thomas, McGowan, um, Lane, and Scales, yep. which is Pender's old brigade, Scales. 
And so they're going to be some of the last um, troops to leave that Rappahannock, Rapidan line uh, after Chancellorsville, watching Hooker's Army, making sure they're not going to come across the river. And they actually do um, engage in some skirmishing uh, with Hooker making some feints across the river uh, in uh, June of 63 as the rest of the army is kind of moving, shifting north into the Shenandoah and moving north into Pennsylvania. So this just uh, so they're the last to leave the Rappahannock, but they're the the Hill's Corps is the one that starts the battle. That's right here. Yep. Um, I understand how Yule got up ahead of him because he was first in, and they kept going straight up and over to York. But uh, but how does how does Hill get ahead of Longstreet? Um, they shift. Yeah, th- they like flip. on purpose, or is Longstreet's corps doing something that? Well, Longstreet's corps was initially on the. Um, I guess it, they were not in the Shenandoah yet. They were kind of mm. marching parallel to the to the the Blue Ridge on the outer edge of the of the valley, and then as Hill's corps comes up. Um, they're going to kind of follow in the wake, and then Longstreet's going to end up taking in the rear of the column. Okay, It's going to be Ewell, uh, Hill, and then Longstreet. But Ewell and Longstreet had moved ahead prior to that. Right, right. They're going to just do a switch, basically. Okay. In, right. in, the be- in the beginning, they're trying to make sure the Union Army doesn't come through the passes. Right. They're trying yep. to guard the passes. Yep. As they're coming up. Uh, and, and that's, I guess, because Stuart, by this point, has started on his ride. Is that why in infantry is well, doing he, that? He leaves later in the month. Um, but eventually he is going to start on his ride. By then, they're, they're, I think they're flip-flopped. What was the date that he started on? 26th? 25th or 26th? 25th, I think June. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay, so uh, the 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 battle is underway on July first. Um, Heath's division, of course, starts it, and uh, there's that n- noon lull, and uh, Pender's division comes up in in support of Heath at first, right? Well, Pettigrew's uh, brigade goes in first P- to back up in the morning. Yes, um, Pender's brigade is in the area of Knoxland's Ridge. Pender's the- division. Oh, excuse me. Um, Pettigrew. Perrin. Powin. Too many P's. I know. <laughs> Powin. Um, Pettigrew. Perrin's Pender. brigade is in the area of Knoxville's Ridge. So they see and hear the engagement that Heath is starting. Okay. So they're not surprised. They hear all this. And then they're going to move towards Harris Ridge. I'll let you if you want to get yeah. into the details of the movement. Sure. And um, so they're going to see all this morning action and hear it. Yep. And then when the afternoon action kicks up, they're going in um, after Pettigrew's men go in. Um, so they're not the first ones thrown in. Right. They're part of this second wave. And it's going to, this is the wave along with the rest of the line that's going to eventually break the Union line northwest of town and push everything back to Right. Because in the morning, Heath's division is only employing two brigades. Two brigades on either side of the Chambersburg pipe. Right. Yeah. And so then the other two brigades that he has are going to reignite the fighting before yeah. Pender's division gets involved. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and what, they, <clears throat> what they're going to basically, Perrin's brigade, if you think of that morning march to Gettysburg with with um, Heath and Pender, Perrin's brigade is going to be smack dab in the middle of that column because mm. they're the first brigade of the second division. They're the first brigade of Pender's division. So you've got Heath uh, marching forward with his four brigades, and then the very first brigade in Pender's division is going to be the, the Perrin South Carolinians. And so you've got the order of march there. You've got um, the 13th South Carolina is going to be uh, the first regiment. Um, and then you've got the 12th, and then you've got uh, the 1st, and then the 14th. Okay. Orr's Rifles Regiment is going to be left behind in the cap in Cashtown to guard the divisional trains. Right. So on paper, they have about 1,800, right? Yeah. 1,882, yeah. according to Brad Godfrey's book here. But because of the, uh, because of, what was it, Orr's? Orr's or, Rifles. Orr's, Orr's yeah. Rifles. Yep. Uh, they have uh, 1,516 um, according to uh, Brad, yeah, I'd say that's that's pretty accurate. I, yeah. I, and I, what, what's interesting is, and they camped the night before. They camped um, 
in in they they described it as a basin in the in the mountains um, just on the other side of Cashtown. Okay. And what's interesting, I've, I've done some research. I actually had a friend of mine did some research on some requisitions that those that guys had, and and I didn't know this, but um, they were getting um, new supplies, new uniforms the night before the battle. Really, and uh, some of the guys in the Twelfth Regiment received brand new jackets and, and trousers oh. um, in Cash Town the night before the battle. Mm. So Just, much for that uh, ragged, barefoot Confederate uh, right, story, right? Right. Yeah, they're going to file right on Knoxland Road, the present day Knoxland Road, um, the division. So and, that's for those of you at home. That's where, where the first uh, shot marker is. Yeah. That's at the intersection of Knoxland Road. Go yeah. ahead. And there's going to be um, it's going to be Perrin's Brigade leading. And then um, you're going to have Scales following him. And then Thomas and Lane are going to deploy initially on the other side of the pike. Eventually, yeah. though, um, as they advance forward from Knoxland Ridge, two brigades on the right side of the pike, two on the left, uh, they're going to move up. And um, some of the men talk about how, well, how strenuous this, this march was across this open field because uh, they're going to go all the way from Knoxland Road up to Hare's Ridge. Yeah, I was just going to – yeah, go ahead. Keep and going. Uh, it's, it's a, they said the perspiration was coming out of them like you wouldn't believe. Trying to maintain those divisional battle lines had to be very difficult. And so they're going to get up to Hare's Ridge, <laughs> and they're basically taking the vacated spot of, of, of Heath's division. Right. And now they're going to halt, and they're, they got a front row, front row viewing of this battle that's unfolding before them. And then Lane's uh, brigade, North Carolinians, the Tar Heels are going to be brought down from the uh, left part of the Chambersburg uh, Pike. They're going to be brought down to to be on the right of Perrin. So you've got Lane, Perrin, Scales, and then on the other side of the Turnpike, you got Thomas. Okay. Uh, all right. So there, there wa- that is a long distance over open fields to travel. Yes. From Knoxland to Hers Ridge. Yes. I mean, that's, even if you were to walk that on the road, that's, what do you, what do you think? That's like a mile? At least. Yeah, at least yeah. a mile. I did a tour with some people last fall, um, you know, a wedding party, just showing them this route. We took that, is it a mill, old mill road? We took old mill road, um, and we basically followed the path of Perrin's Brigade. You know, we had to look off to our left as we're driving down Old Mill Road, but we took that route. It's at least a mile. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be a mile. Yeah. So now to do that over uh, open fields, I mean, there's got to be fences in your way. There's got to be a whole bunch of things that uh, that's such an odd. Why would they do that? You know, you're dealing with a lot of men and you've got to have space. And, And what I'm seeing here is a pattern is Whatever Heath's division did, Pender's division did. Okay. So Heath formed probably most of their men on Knoxland Ridge, and then they moved forward. And so they're va- they're taking the vacated spot of Heath, and they're kind of following in the wake of Heath. So any obstacles would have probably been taken down by Heath's division. Could have been. Yeah. yeah. But there was certainly a lot of hedges, a lot of gardens. Uh, yeah. The men wrote about a lot of cottages. Um, things are going on. And as I'll say, too, uh, as they're marching forward uh, down the Chambersburg Pike earlier that morning, um, they saw a lot of things on the side of the road, uh, pipes, playing cards, uh, things that men were discarding along the road because they knew that the guys in Heath's division were discarding those things because the fight was coming. They didn't mm. want those. They didn't want their families to see that they were, uh, you know, engaging in vice. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that man. I know they must have. Uh, Civil War soldiers must have really spent a fortune on replacing pipes and <laughs> decks of cards, right. tobacco, you know? all, the, all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. They're like, God damn it! I survived. Now I got to go find another pipe to smoke. Uh, okay, so then um, the uh, Heath's division then uh, starts up again after the lull with uh, Pettigrew and Brock and Brow. Um, and then um, Pender's men, they're, they're watching this, obviously. Uh, wh- what's their order? Is it just to be uh, spectators, or are they supposed to support Heath's division? Well, they're, they're initially going to um, halt. And, and rest probably, you know, if, if there's any creeks around there or, or water sources, they're definitely filling canteens. Sure. And they're going to wait there until about um, about four o'clock, four thirty. And Pender's going to basically then um, give the order to move forward. And so in Perrin's brigade, uh, to reiterate, you've got in the brigade, you've got the 13th South Carolina on the right, then the 12th and then the first and then the 14th. OK. First provisional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right, because the other first is guarding the wagons. Yep. Guarding the old wagons. <laughs> uh, okay, so then go ahead, Doug. Which is interesting. Go ahead. If you don't feel the need to guard these wagons, we know there's there's probably no danger for them. Right. You get this, let's say, 370 men, an extra 370 men in the fight. Mm-hmm. Maybe everything goes faster for you. Yep. Yeah. Like yeah. you could have left a company back with the wagons. Yeah. And then let yeah. the whole and regiment they, go. You know, we're... 100 odd 60 years later talking about it but they don't know what's out there sure. at the time but i always think if you had these extra men right maybe you you knock them off seminary ridge faster yep you capture more and then the race to the hill yeah which is essentially what happens is a little bit different but and as an aside is the side uh, dick anderson's division is going to eventually come in and take the vacated spot of pender's division mm-hmm. and and the guys are going to write about how the wounded were falling back there and, and they were upset uh, because anderson's division's guys were just sitting there with stacked arms and smoking their pipes and yeah. cooking rations and they were like we're out here dying and, right and, where are you guys yeah yeah, and and uh, Perrin's going to we can get in this later, but Perrin's going to write a pretty um, strong letter to the governor of South oh, Carolina yeah. after yeah. after the battle about Anderson. Yeah, and, and he says some pretty interesting things about Longstreet too. Yeah, he's not a happy camp. No, no. <laughs> so we I, I want to we should get into that yeah. later. But. That's funny. I got the same thing. Here. Yeah, I'll make a note of it here. Yeah, Perrin's letter. Okay, um, so go ahead, Lewis. Tell us a little bit uh, about when the fighting starts for Pender's division. So they're they're backing up Pettigrew and Brock and Brow. Once they get stalled out, that's when Pender's division is going to be sent forward. Pender tells uh, Colonel Perrin, keep your left attached to Scales. Scales is on the left of Perrin going towards Seminary Ridge. And then Lane is on his right, like we, we've talked about, and supposed to come up. But when they start moving forward... Lane's brigade gets tied up with the 8th Illinois Cavalry, mm-hmm. and they're out on the other side of the Fairfield Road to their right. So they don't travel with Perrin's brigade. They get you know, distracted over here by what's on their right, so they deal with that. So there's no other unit then moving towards Seminary Ridge on Perrin's right. Right. So the 13th South Carolina is completely uncovered. Yeah. It's the right flank of yeah. Perrin's division. Um, for all intents and purposes, brigade. parents' brigade, but the yeah. division it for all intents and purposes. And then coming up towards the Seminary Ridge, there's at least 15 cannon lined up from road to road, Fairfield Road to Chambersburg Pike. There's more cannon across the road, the north side of the Chambersburg Pike. Mm-hmm. And then you got the remnants of uh, Biddle's brigade. You got the remnants of the Iron Corps there. They've built this the who. Iron Brigade. Iron Brigade. And stone. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> they've built this. Uh, this barrier, you know, it's uh, fence rails and such. I don't want to call it breastworks because it's not that. But there's this barrier that the defenders have built, too. It's not a straight line, though, parallel with the road. It's in an angle. The other thing is that's different from today is where if you stand in front of the seminary and you look towards the west, west, northwest, there's the parking lot. There's a wood lot there at the time of the battle. Where this parking lot is today, there's trees there. You're talking in front of the seminary. Yeah, in front yeah. of the seminary. Yeah, yeah. So it's there's trees there. Yeah. Um. So it's not completely open ground right there in front of the seminary. Now, right. if you're looking the same way and you look over towards the right, towards the Chambersburg Pike, where Scales is coming through, that is completely opened. Yep. And Scales Brigade is going to get decimated by cannon fire mm. because they're just out in the middle of everything. Mm-hmm. There is a fence they talk about. Uh, Probably mid midway between McPherson's Ridge, where the the Park Service Road is, and Seminary Ridge, there's a a fence that cuts across that field. Both brigades come up to that fence, and they sort of stall a little bit, and they're just getting tore up. What Perrin tells his brigade before they start is, "Do not fire, do not stop until you get to the enemy." Right, and that's going to be key for them. At yeah. one point, the fourth uh, South Carolina gets hit with this uh, severe volley, and they, they, Perrin senses that they're about to stop and go to ground, and he gets in front of them and he rallies the troops, you know, follow me type thing, and he keeps them going. When they come up towards Seminary Ridge, they've got these cannon placed there firing at them. They've got the remnants of Union infantry that's fallen back to them, but to their right front. Over towards what you picture it today where the Schultz house is, 
going down West Confederate Avenue, Gamble's uh, Cav. Cav, his troopers are over there. And there's a stone wall there today. You know, there was a stone wall back then, too. If you travel down that road and look to your right, yep. rather than looking to the pretty house, there is the stone wall. So Gamble's men are over there. Perrin is going to split his four regiments at this point. He's going to send the 12th and the 13th to the right to face this threat from Gamble's um, cavalry. And the 14th and the 1st are going to continue forward. But they're Mm -hmm. coming up against this barrier Mm -hmm. that the Union Army has set set up as a defensive position. So that's going to be a problem. What Perrin does to alleviate this problem is, and this is leadership, you know, we contrast this with the other side with O'Neill and Iverson. Um, Perrin's going to take the 1st South Carolina, oblique them to the right so they can go around this barrier and then have them come back towards their left. So they're coming in on the flank of the Union infantry and those cannon that are stacked up on Seminary Ridge. It's like Biddle's Brigade? Yeah, while the 14th is still going forward. So this is going to flank the Union forces on Seminary Ridge, and this is when they're going to have to leave. Yeah, because yeah, um, on so according to uh, the map here in the Lena book that I'm looking at, mm-hmm. now this might be at a different point in the battle that you're talking about, but okay, yeah, um, yeah, okay. So there's a ba- all right, so there's a battery Bauer. Never heard of that. It must have been who's Bauer? Oh, and he leaves. He yeah, leaves. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So at first. He's there, but then he leaves in the game. Okay, so this is later on once everybody starts leaving that this happens. Well, so, so it's a it's a ragged line of Union infantry out there, right. and, and it's it's remnants of all these different brigades. But but to put this in context, this attack starts out as a three brigade attack, and it slowly becomes or quickly becomes one, Aaron, one yeah. brigade yeah. because Scales is going to ground. Those guys are getting blistered by the artillery. Yeah, they're they're just. You know, cashed, and and Lane is lagging. What happens if I could if I could uh, go a little bit before of what what Lewis said? The thirteenth is going to start to lag a little bit, okay. And they're going to open up the right flank of the twelfth, and the twelfth is going to have to halt and return fire. And they've they're going to peel off a couple of companies to refuse their flank to allow time for the thirteenth to get up there. Finally, as Lewis pointed out, you you've got the the brigade now divides. And and Lewis is is perfectly right. He you know the the first and the fourteenth are going to oblique right and then left to kind of flank uh, Biddle's guys out of um, the seminary area, and then the twelfth and the, the orders for the twelfth are going to be to change fronts and the thirteenth to change fronts to the right, wheel to the right, and the the thirteenth is basically going to attack Gamble's men head on, while the twelfth flanks them on their right flank. It's sort of a mirror image, yes, of the first and the fourteenth, yes. Yep. And between these, they're going to drive a wedge right between, right through the the Fairfield Road, divide those troops, and and they're going to flee. They're gone. Mm. Uh, so you, you were talking before, just to back up a little bit, you were talking before about Perrin ordering them, you know, I have a quote here from, uh, let's see, this is according to Sergeant B. Brown of the 1st South Carolina. Uh, Perrin says, uh, men, the order is to advance. You will go to the crest of the hill. If Heath does not need you, lie down and protect yourselves as well as you can. If he needs you, go to, the, to, go to his assistance at once. Do not fire your guns. Give them the bayonet. If they run, then see if they can outrun the bullet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. I like that. Okay, so um, so Perrin's brigade then, uh, yeah, they go in and then they... they it looks like they're the ones who are kind of causing the collapse of the left flank of the Union Army. 100%. They are. Because yeah. Lane ain't there. Pettigrew's, you know, he's back over McPherson's woods. Scales, there, there is. Scales getting, is done. Yep. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I hate, I have to think that Scales is getting ate up so much because there's not as much trees in front of them. They're really out in the open. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It took me a long time to figure out that there was trees in his parking lot. And Pender's going to actually ride over to Scales while this is all yeah. happening. And he's going to try to help Scales because that's his old brigade. And and so Perrin is kind of left to his own devices here. And in fact, once the federal troops fall back from Seminary Ridge, Pender rides up. And he actually, pro- I've got a, a first person account of this. There's a Lieutenant Simmons uh, from the 12th South Carolina who was wounded and Pender is riding up to him, and he's kind of in that swale 
in that open area uh, between the seminary and, I guess, um, Willoughby Run. And he okay. looks at Simmons and he goes, w- what happened to Perrin's Brigade? Like, he thought they had been defeated and destroyed because they were he couldn't see him over beyond the crest of seminary Ridge. Ah, got it. and simmons says well they're just up over yonder sir and and he was convinced that maybe the brigade had been defeated ah uh, okay because right because the other brigades are still visible to him right lane and, and skills all right so then uh does that end it for perrin's brigade on the first well not really two oh. of the regiments are chasing them into town yep. okay is that um, what the 14th and 1st? 1st and 14th. Let's yep. back up real back quick. Up. Uh, you're, the, you're the guide. I discovered this uh, when I, I got put together to get out of the car tour last year. Uh-huh. So that there's a great. monument on the corner of uh, Fairfield Road and Seminary Ridge Road where it turns into West Confederate, right there by the Schultz House. Uh-huh. There's a monument to Company D, 149th Pennsylvania. They were... The uh, headquarters guard for Doubleday's headquarters, the, you know, and they were stationed behind the seminary on the east side of the seminary. And then, you know, when that line is starting to break, Doubleday sends this company from behind there to go out and help and try to hold stem the tide of uh, Parents Brigade. They're unsuccessful. They get pushed off. But that monument there on the corner says... Company D, 149th here, helping repulse the attack of Scales Brigade. It's Perrin's Brigade. Mm. Mm. Right. So I saw that right. and I said, and I think that was uh, dedicated 1886. Don't quote me on that. Around that point. Where is, where is this marker? It's on the corner. It's right by the Schultz house. Oh, okay. Right there yeah. on that corner. I know what you're talking about. Um, it's a it's a square block yep. monument. Uh, most people drive by it and probably looking at the pretty house and saying, wow, I'd love to live there. And they don't <laughs> yeah. notice the monument. Yeah. Exactly. But it says they're there trying to repulse Scales Brigade. Mm. Interesting. And they would If that's what they're doing, they did a great job. They, mm. did, they, they did it from <laughs> they a, didn't do quite it very a distance. effectively <laughs> against Parents Brigade, who <laughs> right. overruns them all. Right. right. Well, they were so. too busy worrying about Scales Brigade yeah. all the way so. over at the Chambersburg Pike. And it's, I thought, I said, somebody else knows about this. Like, you know, Tim Smith or somebody's got this in their head. Right. I just haven't heard it before. But yeah. I saw it. I was like, well, look at there. Well, look at there. This, uh, as far as I know, is the first public mention of that. So Other now everyone. Last, we di- I did mention it on our tour. On the tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now this will be heard around worldwide. the world. Yes. Worldwide. That's a new one for me. I, yeah. I didn't know that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go now, ladies and gentlemen. Lewis Trott is the one we can credit with discovering that. I'd like to thank everybody that supported me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm done here. I'll see you all next week. <laughs> um, okay, but so they're, they're, go ahead. The yeah. 1st and 14th are doing the pursuit. Doing. Yeah. Um, and they're going to go into town. How far they go into town? I don't know. I think well, I read where they reach Washington Street. I've read where they reach the square. Caldwell has them in the square and he yeah. says the, you know, the South Carolinians were the first to raise their flag and get yeah. Bergen. And I, you know, it's hard to say, but they certainly pursued them down the Chambersburg Pike. Yep. There are some accounts that some of them went down Middle Street as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that makes at, sense. And at the same time, you know, everything's crashing down on the north part of the field. Too, right. So. But eventually, they're going to get recalled. Uh, Pender is going to recall everybody back to the area of the seminary. Um, now, wait. So the 14th and 1st South Carolina from uh, Perrin's Brigade are chasing everybody into town. Are they the only two Confederate regiments in that area that are giving pursuit? or Because, I mean, scales, obviously, no. I but think Ramsier's Brigade is... is- Coming down, but that's further up. And I, probably, mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, around the seminary, yeah. yeah uh, of all yeah. those, yeah, they're the only yep. ones given pursuit yep. because on the other side of the the road would be Daniel's, Daniel. and they don't go all the yeah. way, right? Yeah, and, right. And the twelfth and the thirteenth um, do not follow the um, the uh, dismounted cab guys. Yeah. They kind of stay there on Seminary Ridge, there at the corner there of, of where Lewis was just talking yeah. about. Um, but and they're going to make an account that they they watch these guys, these Federals, fall back to Cemetery Hill which, you know, back then was an open vista. Mm-hmm. And he said that the, that the some of the first guys to fall back there um, ended up using a cannon yeah. to fire back fire the, on them. The first cannon fired from yeah. there was it directed at them. Yeah. And uh, it's these people that escaped they, from just, them. They watched them do this. <laughs> if, if they could have just captured them all because yeah. they didn't have any support, right. none of this would have happened. Right, right. There's already cannon there. Yeah. Come on. Uh, yeah, right, really. Um, well, that's interesting. All right. So then uh, what else? Where else are we? 
you know, I've got some accounts that um, that Robert E. Lee actually rides up after this is happening and, and doffs his hat to the, quote, the South Carolina Brigade that captured Gettysburg. Um, and they're going to be shifted off to the right as Daniels and Ramsour's men come in. They're going to be shifted to the right of the Fairfield Road. Mm-hmm. And that's where they're going to camp right along that stone wall. Yep. That night. It's still there. And the 14th South Carolina is going to be down at the McMillan House. And from the from that portion to the left, with the left of the brigade, and, and I believe that the 12th is on that road, um, they're going to be camped throughout that, that area. Yeah. So you got the 12th, 13th, the 14th, and then the 1st camped uh, down that way, you're saying? Yep, right along uh-huh. Confederate Avenue yep. with the right flank of the brigade right in the orchard of the McMillan Farm. Yep. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then, uh, so the, the day ends, July 1st ends, and, uh, July 2nd naturally comes after that. Uh, does Pewin's Brigade get involved with anything on July 2nd? Not really. Um, there's a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. There's some skirmish firing out front. There, when Rhodes Division moves down to Long Lane, Heron's Division, or excuse me. Pewin's Parents Brigade, Brigade is going Brigade. to be to the right of Ramsier. Right. And and what happens is that morning, there, there's Federals in Long Lane already. Yeah. And what happens is um, Pender or Perrin is going to order the Sharpshooter Battalion of this of this brigade, which I know there's a question about that perhaps. But so this is a hand-picked unit of men under Captain Haskell. Yep. He's going to charge down there um, with the assistance of a couple of companies from the 12th. And they're going to drive these Federals out of Long Lane pretty early in the morning on on relatively early in the morning yeah. on the 2nd. Confederates are going to then hold Long Lane. But for the rest of the day, they're basically, you know, idle on Seminary Ridge except for that sharpshooter battalion in the Long Lane. When Rhodes uh, and the, the July 2nd evening attacks commence, Rhodes is going to bring his division out of town. And as we know, you know, there's some timing issues there. But he's going to end up halting in Long Lane. And then Perrin is going to be ordered to bring his brigade up into Long Lane along with Thomas. Uh-huh. And so you've got uh, Thomas, Perrin, um, Ramsour, yep. um, Daniel. Um, Daniel's in the... And one other brigade um, because the other two had been shuttled off oh, to... Uh, over to... Uh, well, Daniel's... Hill. Daniel's in the second line because him and O'Neill go to Culp's Hill. Right, yeah. right. Daniel and O'Neill go to Culp's Hill. So you got Doles, Ramser, and um, Iverson. Iverson. Wait, do, they go, do they go to Culp's Hill on the second or yes. the third? They go over in the night. They go around the, late on the night. night. The yeah, night. Late okay. night they're over there. Yep. So they're, okay. ready, they're in there in the early morning ready to go. Yeah, sure. So but, you, mo- but most of the day, July 2nd, they're in Long Lane. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then, and so the, the well, no. no they're no, in no. the town. They're in the town. Yeah. In the evening of July 2nd, they all move into Long Lane. Yeah. Because they're supposed to attack Cemetery Hill. Yep. Yes, in coordination with Okay. Years. And that attack is aborted because but they of don't. timing issues. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, and so then uh, Perrin's brigade and uh, Thomas's are, are sent down to Long Lane with them. Correct. Okay. Got that. All right. All right. And then, uh, so how about July 3rd? Anything for them on July 3rd? Heavy, heavy, heavy skirmishing. Skirmishing, yep. Uh-huh. Heavy, but now okay. Heavy, heavy, heavy skirmishing. What does that mean? Like, well, uh, I mean, because you mean how many heavies before you get into a battle? Well, <laughs> you know, they 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 characterize this as a small battle. I mean, and it's one of the really unknown, unwritten about things about the battle, which I think would be a great, you know, somebody to really do a, a work on. So that. this is an addressing Gettysburg exclusive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what was that? I don't know. Oh it's my god! Stupid sound I had here. <laughs> Did I just have an exclusive? On yeah, it? I guess. I mean, nobody, nobody ever talks that's the, about that's it. First right? time on my on the yeah. show. Yeah, <laughs> you know where that came from. Yeah, wait, maybe we could do like <laughs> exclusive. <laughs> but they're gonna they're basically gonna be back and forth with those federals on cemetery on West Cemetery Hill, yeah. and they're gonna deploy entire regiments out into that open field to skirmish with with guys like the Eighth Ohio and the other uh, other troops there on West Cemetery Hill. All day, um, and they're going to have a front row seat to pick its charge. Are these the guys that uh, killed Nixon's great grandpappy? He gets killed on the second. It could be. Oh, but it's. Yeah, but it's. I, I think I've I've heard that the area he's killed in is uh, behind the Heritage Center over in 
Is that housing development back yeah, there? Yeah, Cole somewhere? Park. Somebody's on, backyard. Yeah. I was on, uh, what is the name of that road? Fairway or Fairview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think right at Fairview. the top of the, yeah, yeah. the ridge there. Yeah. I That's think. the night of the second. I think it's the, the night, night of the second. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. But there's a lot going on between West Cemetery Hill and Long Lane. Okay. Um, and... Uh, but that's it, and then they get they just get to watch Pickett's charge. Yep. But that's uh, so the heavy, 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 heavy skirmishing, and uh, then spectator yep. of uh, Pickett's charge. And, and the some day of the guys they watch the uh, Bliss Farm fight. Yep. yep. Yeah. And some of the men wrote about you know they didn't understand why they weren't thrown in. Yeah. Um, to Pickett's charge, yeah. and uh, well, many of us don't, and and Thomas's brigade especially. Yep. You know, Caldwell wrote that that um, he thought everything was going. Uh, Caldwell is the the brigade adjutant, um, and he wrote a history of the brigade after the war. But he wrote that um, everything seemed to be going fine with Pickett's Charge until they got up to the fence, and things kind of just fell apart at at the Emmitsburg Road. Hmm. Yeah, and that's a we did a tour with that side of the field um, two years ago. But that's the difference between that side, um, Pettigrew and Trimble's area of responsibility, and Pickett's. Those fences had already been knocked down on the second day because mm-hmm. you got Wright's Brigade right. coming across, the Floridians and such. So they've already knocked all that down. Nobody sweeps across that area on July 2nd. So the fences along the road are still there, yeah. whereas Pickett doesn't have mm. the, the, the problem of the fences. Yeah. So we always— yeah, I don't. I say we, me. I should say me all the time. Me, I always used to think that everybody faced that problem of the fence. Mm-hmm. But it's. I think it's more northern yeah. Emmitsburg Road. I agree. Uh, okay, so then that that brings us to the end of their fighting. Unless you want to add anything more during the Battle of Gettysburg. Like I said, I think we we before. Um, their actions here at Gettysburg are, are vastly underrated. Them yeah. and Doles, yep. two of the biggest underrated Confederate brigades here at Gettysburg, and and, and the two that two that really experienced victory here. Yeah, you know, right, they, right. They came out of here. Uh, they couldn't understand how how they lost because yeah. from their perspective, everything had gone very well. Right, and um, they had great morale coming out of here because they had they'd been very successful. How about after the battle? What happens with Perrin's brigade after the battle? They're going to fall back with the army, with uh, with Hill's Corps. Uh, they're going to um, go to um, uh, Falling Waters. Yep. And they're going to uh, be camped there with the rest of the army as they wait that that out with the the, the tide going down on the on the river and. Um, they are going to come to the support of uh, Pettigrew's brigade when Pettigrew gets wounded, mortally wounded there at Falling Waters, um, with the cavalry coming in and, and, and striking down Pettigrew. And then uh, once they get back, well, how about the rest of the war? Do they uh, do they make it to Appomattox or do they, they uh, do. discharge? Okay, they Perrin do. doesn't. No, no. What happens? And he Perrin? doesn't even stay with the brigade. Uh huh. Because McGowan comes back. Okay. He, I think it's February of '64. Yeah, so um, he takes charge again. Abner Perrin is going to be promoted to brigadier general. Um, he was a colonel here, right? But he's going to be promoted in September of '63. Um, I don't know if they thought that McGowan wasn't coming back or not, but he got promoted. But when McGowan did come back, um, uh, Perrin was then transferred to Cadmus Wilcox's old Alabama brigade in Dick, Dick Anderson's division. So he's going to command that Alabama brigade moving forward, and McGowan will reassume command of the South Carolina brigade. Got it. And they will t- they'll they'll fight in the Overland campaign. They're gonna they're gonna hold together. They're gonna be very instrumental in all of those battles up and down the railroads at Petersburg. Um, they're gonna spend. They're, they're gonna their real their glory moment of the war perhaps is uh, at the Buell Shoe in Spotsylvania. They're going to spend 18 hours fighting there at the dead blo- at the bloody angle, which is where their former commander gets killed. Aha! Parent. Okay. Yeah, Parent. Parent's going to be killed there yep. um, as well. But they uh, survive the war. The brigade remains very intact. I think they have around 900 men at the end of the war, which is a very large number for a brigade at right. that time. And um, what's interesting is they're going to try to march home together as a brigade. 
Um, Wilcox's light division <laughs> forms up after the surrender, and he's going to march them literally through the Union lines as a division uh, without arms. And they're going to disband, and each brigade is going to head in their own direction. And McGowan's going to try to keep this brigade together to go home. But after a day or two, he, he can't feed them. You know, they mm-hmm. don't have any money. Mm-hmm. And so he's going to tell every regiment, you know, you can do what you need to do to get home. But it's an interesting thing. The brigade uh, really was a strong a strong unit uh, up until the very end. All right. Well, uh, we're going to take our break now, and then we're going to come back and uh, – uh, take questions from the audience, from not the audience, excuse me, from our patrons over at <laughs> patreon.com <laughs> slash addressing Gettysburg. Uh, again, you want to, uh, to ask some questions, you got to do the, the Patreon thing. That's one of the perks. Any level will get you that uh, privilege. <clears throat> uh, otherwise, that's it. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Who can forget the sounds of the 60s? The 1860s. I can't, and you can't either. Now, there's Marching Through Georgia, the exciting new album by Billy Webster. All of your favorite hits of the 1860s in one place. Such hits as Gary Owens. (laughs) The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Quiet along the Potomac tonight. Marching through Georgia. And much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Go to billysongs.com and order your digital download of Billy Webster's Marching Through Georgia today. That's billysongs.com. Attention all aficionados of Union Civil War music, your ensemble awaits. The National Association of Civil War Musicians, founded by the Grand Army of the Republic, serves as a beacon for those who cherish the notes that stirred a nation. Our association is a hub where the scores of the past are preserved and the spirit of camaraderie persists. Immerse yourself in the melodies that played through history. For example, take July 3rd, 1863. As Lee's cannons unleashed a maelstrom, the Philadelphia Brigade Band exemplified valor. Positioned at the heart of the onslaught, their music defied the cacophony of the largest artillery barrage in North American history. Their presence was a deliberate symbol. If the band could stand tall and play, then the infantrymen can lay in wait to hold that crucial ground. Today, we keep this and other memories alive. No matter if you sound the fife, beat the drum, or swell the brass, your contribution breathes life into our mission. Let's commemorate, collaborate, and preserve together. Step forward and join the ranks today. Visit NACWM.org. That's NACWM.org, the National Association of Civil War Musicians, honoring all the brave soldiers who dared to wage a war with only an instrument. If you're a lover of history, then go to TRHistorical.com. There, you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of subjects from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will save 15% when using promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So go to trhistorical.com. TR Historical, for the love of history. Movies and documentaries about history are spread out across the internet, and their quality is often suspect. History Fix delivers curated historic programming to your preferred device using their website or branded apps. Join History Fix for movies, documentaries, short films, and how-tos. Content covers historic eras ranging from the 1st to the 21st centuries. Their team of curators brings you the most comprehensive and authentic historical content available. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive 20% off their first annual subscription. So what are you waiting for? Sign up at www.historyfix.com and use promo code ADGBURG. That's A-D-G-B-U-R-G. Every subscription begins with a seven-day risk-free trial. And after signing up, download the History Fix app on your smartphone. So go to www.historyfix.com and use promo code ADGBURG. That's A-D-G-B-U-R-G on an annual subscription. Escape into history. With Our favorite fix. bookstore in Gettysburg is For the Historian, located at 42 York Street. It's because they have the best selection of Civil War books in Gettysburg, both new and used. And online, they have even more to choose from. And if the Civil War isn't your thing, that's not a problem. 
This is for the historian, after all. They cover history from the ancient world to the 21st century with a strong selection of World War II and American Revolution books. It's astounding how many thousands of titles from Osprey, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more they have in their store. And that's because, well, they have a warehouse too. And that's where they keep all the books that are available online at ForTheHistorian.com. And folks, if you go to ForTheHistorian.com now and order books until you're blue in the face, be sure you mention that you heard about them on Address in Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund your shipping costs. And if you prefer to stop by when you're in town, well, you could do that too. Just mention Address in Gettysburg at checkout, and they'll take 20% off the retail price of your item. So go to ForTheHistorian.com or stop by 42 York Street, or you can call them at 717-685-5207. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. Civil War Trails is the world's largest open-air museum offering over 1,500 sites and stories for you to explore. Each Civil War Trails site has an interpretive sign to help fuel your imagination as you stand on remote mountaintop artillery positions, in fields where thundering cavalry charges took place, or in now quiet downtowns where raids, riots, or raiders shattered the peace. Over 60 Civil War Trail sites allow you to stand in the footsteps of the Gettysburg Campaign across Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and of course, Pennsylvania. In fact, they are expanding further into Pennsylvania now with the latest sites in Wrightsville, Hanover, and Chambersburg. As you travel the trail, you'll find more than just great history. Beyond battlefields, great barbecue, beer, and bourbon await. Here's a pro tip. Carry cash and never book your day completely to ensure that you can take that gravel road, explore that hiking trail, or pick up an amazing artifact from that awesome antique shop you find along the way. Request a free brochure shipped right to your door at civilwartrails.org and be sure to snap a hashtag sign selfie next time you are out exploring. Click the link to Civil War Trails in our show notes. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. Okay, we're back now, and it is time for us to get to uh, the questions from our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Um, but before we do, uh, Perrin wrote a letter to the governor of South Carolina after the Battle of Gettysburg. What did he say? He was he was upset on a number of levels. He was upset that, uh, that General Pender had been uh, mortally wounded because Pender... Um, was was his guy and yeah. he thought that Pender was going to you know speak glowingly about his performance at for, during the first day and for promotion uh, and so he's a little um upset that Pender is not there to kind of you know uh, burnish his credentials sure um and so he's also going to be pretty critical of um of Dick Anderson for not coming up with his division Richard H Anderson's division um, I think he's going to write, um, I suppose, wrote Perrin shortly after the battle to the governor of South Carolina, quote, you will be curious to know where Anderson was and why he was out of the way at so important of a juncture. His failure to be up was the cause of the failure of the campaign. It may have been General Hill's fault and it may have been the fault of Anderson himself, he complained. Um, he didn't withhold any feelings about Longstreet either. He said that Longstreet, at the critical moment um, that Lee's old war horse was, quote, as usual, was out of the way and was not seen on the field until the next day. <laughs> Probably not fair to Longstreet, but 
it's just interesting to to see how they were thinking about these things. Yeah. Uh, what the was the date on that letter? Jul- late July. Uh, you, you probably have it, don't you, oh. Lewis? And it's late. It's it's within a, it's within thirty days of the battle. Yeah, I don't. So have, he's already blaming Longstreet. I've only got one page that I saved here, in my little. And he's upset at Anderson for for not coming because, like I said, Anderson's division was. On the first day, was their you know stacked arms on on Hare's Ridge? Their men were you know hanging out, smoking and, uh, and cooking rations, and and they you know they weren't coming to their help. Right, and he's the one that writes. But they um, but but he would he should know that they just can't up and go. They have to have orders to go. Right, yeah. and, and he says you know it may have been Anderson's fault. It may have been Hill's fault. Yeah. You know, he, right. he's not. He just was complaining that they weren't put into the fight. That someone wasn't putting them into the fight. Yeah. Because yeah. had they done that, they would have easily swept the field. And I think, in conjunction with Ewell, I think they very well could have made a crack at Cemetery Hill. Yeah. With with Anderson's full. Right. Because you yeah. have that fresh division. Help. As it is, I don't think he's going to take the hill. Just as things stood. Right. No. He had tried. He wasn't going to take See, the hill. people are always saying, if only they let Hood go around to the right. Or. If Jackson was there, or if Ewell had taken Culp's Hill, but what nobody ever says if they had put Anderson's division in. Nope. Yeah, yeah. but that could have actually done a lot more. Ewell asked for help. Yeah. He's told no. Yeah. And and that's, hmm. you know, Lee Lee saying that he was, Anderson was his only reserve, which I don't understand that because he had Longstreet's two divisions not even a day's yeah. march behind mm-hmm. as a potential reserve, so... I'm not sure why Anderson's division was not put into the fight. But don't, you know, I'm no general, but, you know, you've got the enemy on the run. You've inflicted many, many casualties on them. They're scattered about. Isn't that when you throw your fresh reserves in to mop up the field? I think they had pushed the Union Army around so much, there's no thought that they can't push them around again tomorrow. Yeah, see, that's ridiculous to me. I would be like, yeah. no, tomorrow, a lot can happen between now and tomorrow. Yeah, but they had... You know, look what they do at Chancellorsville when they should have been overrun then. Yeah. Lee splits his army three times. Yeah. And they come out with the upper hand, push them across the river. They they go across the river. They're just been, they've been pushing around the Union. They're like a bully. Mm. And they've, they're just pushing them whenever they want, wherever they want. They've pushed them on the first day. Took a little effort. There's no reason for them to think, well, it, we didn't get as far as we wanted to today. We'll get up tomorrow and do it. And, and let me point. just say, this this first day's battle with Perrin and Pender and Heath is a textbook classic example of the the unit moving in first fixes the enemy, gets their attention, and the second line comes through and sweeps through. It is textbook Civil War tactics, which you don't see on the second and third days. Mm. You don't have those supporting units coming up on the second day, on the third day, to push – drive home your attack. Yeah. Well, the only one that does it is Longstreet. Uh-huh. Longstreet stacks his brigades. Right. They attack with depth. Right. And but there's once, just not enough. Yeah, there's not enough. You know, but once it leaves his line, right. there's no depth there's to Nobody's attack. doing anything. Yeah. But, but the tactics employed on the first day with, with Heath and Pender, I think, is a textbook example of how you win a battle like this, mm-hmm. how you drive the enemy from the field. All right. So let's get to our questions. Well, let me, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Let's go back to the letter again. This is where we have the... Um, and this is a Pender writing to the governor. The enemy during this eventful time was taking their new position at Cemetery Hill, which afterwards baffled all our efforts to take. The very batteries which we had run off <laughs> and which we saw them take off through Gettysburg were the first to fire a shot from the new dire- new position. The very infantry that we had run from the stone walls that surrounded Gettysburg were the first to form a line of battle in their new position. The first shell fired by them from that position was aimed at my brigade. Which tells me Hmm. that they certainly, if they had employed some additional troops, if that quote is accurate, Anderson's division could have made a very big impact. Yeah, I think it could have. And then in the in the Gottfried book here, he has the postscript after uh, he signed off to the uh, governor... um, do you like me? Yes, no, circle one. So that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that Everybody's Matt a middle Callery schooler. Exclusive? Everybody's a middle Yes. That was a Matt exclusive. <laughs> exclusive. All right, here we go with the questions. Uh, Brian Jackson, he is a patron. 
a proud patron. He says, I know that the brigade suffered around 500 casualties on July 1st in overtaking the seminary. Why were they not considered for use in Piquet's charge, as they would have seemed to be in better shape than Scales' brigade, which was in the attack? That's a good question, Brian. It's a brilliant question. Yep. Who knows? Who Nobody knows. I don't know. I mean, if if you look at, I think the the closest you can come there with that analysis is um, uh, Robert Rhodes's report. He says on the third that his orders were the same as on the second, which was to wait for an opportunity and if you see something, you know, move ahead. Mm. And so I, I know that Perrin's brigade was not in Rhodes's division, but those all those guys right were in there. Long Lane. And I think if Rhodes had given the command to move forward. Perrin and Thomas would have gone. So, so was it that Perrin and Thomas were uh, attached to Rhodes's division, well, or were they they were just in his area of operation or of, of uh, influence? They were in his area of influence. And yeah. remember, Pender had been wounded yeah. the night before. Oh, so yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of a avoid. You know, uh, James Lane is in command of the division because he's the senior sure. brigade commander. But uh, certainly, I think if Rhodes had moved forward, those guys would have probably gone with him. But it's a great question. Why were they not used? I think they should have been because they were the closest. And Lee is very active. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Th- th- this morning in um, July 3rd morning, you know, mid-morning going into the afternoon because he's seen several times with AP Hill and uh, Longstreet. Soldiers write that they see them riding back and forth, stopping and gesturing towards the other side. Um, so it's. You know, he's very active in putting the units where he wants. He has the authority to say, I want this unit where, the, you know, here or there or somewhere else. So ultimately, it rests with him. Yeah, and Why except- he doesn't use them? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and then that same question for Thomas's brigade. And I hear people asking that more often. <clears throat> Thomas's brigade. You don't hear a thing about them. What, what, what did they do ever yeah. in this battle? Yeah. But somehow they lost like 250 men. Yeah. A lot of artillery casualties, probably. Yeah, yeah okay, that makes sense. They got sense. their park thing stamped, but but they <laughs> but they I tell you, they this the, your your um, questionnaire here is right. <laughs> Thomas or Perrin would have been a much better candidate than Scales's brigade. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's see what am I looking for here? Okay, uh, the next one is Balthazar. Balthazar has uh, he sent in five questions. A lot of them we kind of covered, so I'm gonna. Be clever here, if I can. Uh, <clears throat> first thing, uh, he wants to know uh, Perrin's brigade, uh, you know, that pursued the Union troops into town, the, those regiments that did, were they involved in the capture of Captain Francis Ursh's, uh, Ursh of the uh, 45th New York in, I, I in and around the Eagle Hotel? I don't think so, because they get pulled back. Um, Before? Yeah. Yeah. That, that so, was my just, analysis. Yeah. They're just, yeah. they're not in there long enough. Um and, and another problem they have when they come into town, they're coming in from one direction. Confederates are coming in sort of to their left front. There, there's also a, a, people afraid of friendly fire incidents because it's so confusing. Oh, yes. And you've got Confederates coming in from different directions, and it's getting dark. They don't want, um, or it will be getting dark, um, any uh, friendly fire incidents either. So. So how far do you think, because he wants to know what was the path of Perrin's brigade capturing the town, how far do you think they got? The, like I said, was that the 12th and 13th? I forget. That would be the, be first, the first and, and the 14th. 14th. Damn, yeah. I wasn't even close. Yeah. You had the teen, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 12th and 13th were stuck up on the ridge by the Schultz house. That's yeah. not stuck, yeah. but they were yep. remaining yeah. there. Go ahead. Some soldiers say they make it to the square. Yeah. yeah. I'm well, sure some did. Washington yeah. Street's mentioned, Middle Street. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, it's, I'm they're sure using, they're not marching in no. perfect no, order. No, it's, it's a mob. It's yeah. pell-mell. Yeah. Because all these, and nobody has a street map. Right. So, uh, I mean, the, I, the man they, with the red shirt wasn't here directing traffic. <laughs> they very well could have captured some of these guys, but but I think generally speaking, they'd already vacated that. Yeah, because he surrenders. The, the When he surrenders, he's surrendering the group that's holding that little area. Mm-hmm. Um, which You're talking about Ursh. Yeah. Which is, uh, you got to hand it to him because he's occupying Confederates too. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, he holds his ground and it's it's sort of a roadblock for for the Confederates trying to get behind him towards, eventually to, to the hill. So, 
And we, we kind of touched on this earlier, but I'll ask it again if you want to clarify it a little bit more. How did the first rifles and the first provisional South Carolina infantry get these designations beyond the normal designations of number state volunteer regiments? I mean, it is kind of weird. Like, if you already have the first provisional at the onset of at least uh, secession, if not the war, then why wouldn't the next one be the second? I, I think the distinguishing factor here is the fact that Orr's regiment was going to be a rifle regiment, yeah, which was, ah, which was with light muskets. infantry. <laughs> um, it's 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 cooler, so to speak. I'm, I'm using that in air quotes, but sure. like it's, we're a rifle regiment, so, so we're the, the first we're rifle. the first rifle regiment, uh-huh. and so I think that's where it where you get that um, distinguishing feature. And the okay, provisional that makes unit sense. just kept that that label provisional, even yeah. though after that six months, the the original yeah. six months was up. These soldiers reenlist. The provisional tag goes away, yeah. theoretically. And I don't see them they, being they called just, the provisional after, yeah. much after that. Right, so it's the first. First South, South Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. Right. And, and then the rifle regiment was always just called Orr's Rifles. Orr's Rifles, yeah. Because that was Orr, uh, James Orr was their first commander, and that's yeah. how they went. Got it, okay. All right, he left, uh, he was a politician. Politician, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, what was the background of the skirmisher battalion on the 2nd of July? Did the soldiers in this battalion have any specialized weapons? Yeah. So th- I didn't know about the weapons, but I know I think each brigade in Pender's division had something similar yeah. where they take the best shots right. from each uh, regiment. It's 100 men. Yeah. So basically they, they took about 120 men, divided them up into three companies from the brigade in in the spring of 63 uh, as they are preparing for the invasion and they're going to be in three companies each under a lieutenant and they're going to be commanded by William T Haskell of the 1st South Carolina. Okay. And so they're going to kind of organize this ad hoc battalion of three companies and they're going to Which kinda, wait, which first? Uh would be the 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 first provisional. Okay. And they're going to be under command of this this Captain Haskell and they're going to be we should have mentioned that probably during our battle talk was they're going to be on kind of the right flank of yeah. the of the brigade when they advanced um, kind of covering their right but anyway um, so they're going to be about 120 men and they're organized but right after the battle because things are so depleted in Lee's army these guys are going to bleed back into the regiments and this sharpshooter battalion is going to go away okay but but it's going to be reinstituted the following spring with a full contingent of a three-company battalion um, that's actually going to be led by a, a captain of the 12th Regiment, um, and they're going to be a sharpshooter battalion for the rest of the war. But this particular sharpshooter battalion at Gettysburg fought one battle, and it was here, and then it, it kind of disbanded. But they took the guys with the best shots. Um, they were armed primarily with infield rifles. The following spring, they were armed with those um, two-band infield rifles. Mm-hmm. Those were the best rifles that they had, that they, the sharpshooters really liked them. And so, um, but this particular sharpshooter battalion under command of Captain Haskell, who's actually going to be killed in Long Lane, I think on the 3rd, yep. um, it's going to be disbanded after the battle because they need these men back in the regiments because they've taken so many casualties. Anything else, Lewis? He covered it. Buy his book when it comes out. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just going to say, uh, can you give us any kind of, uh, you said uh, 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 2024 is when it's going to come out. Um, is it through Savas Beatty? Yes. Okay. And so we'll be able to get it through there. Sure. Um, just keep, what's the name of it? It's, it's going to be called the Invincible 12th, the 12th South Carolina Volunteer Infantry during the Civil War. Was oh, that the last good. question? That was okay. I do have something. Well, else. there were a couple. He had like, he had like five, but we we got uh, okay. into a few. Yeah, of them. I do have one more thing. Go ahead, because I found this this uh, long lost letter, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, because it's not dealing with um, the Perrin's regiments in particular. It's just about the overall situation. So on the first day, you've got Double Day out there fighting, and later on after the war, um, this is his last big hurrah too in the army. Here at Gettysburg, but every you know, and he goes on and invents baseball and whatnot. <laughs> but at one point, he was the president of the American Theosophical Society, whatever that is. I don't know hmm. what, what is it. Is. Theosophical Society. Well, it's like a uh, philosophical, philosophical, but, but theo- also lights. theological. Got it. Got it. Got it. So it's so. Uh, theological, philo- philosophy, philosophically. But here at Gettysburg, his division commander gets bumped up to. Um, 
corps commander because Reynolds is a wing commander. So right. He's corps commander, and then he, he gets done away with. Um, but he's on one end of the field. There's, there's no. It was interesting to me. There's no reason for him to know some lowly regimental commander on the other end of the field. But later on, he writes this lowly regimental commander on the other end of the field because this other guy becomes popular because he's writing a bunch of stuff. So I find this letter. And I just, I've never seen it published anywhere, and I find this letter. Uh, it's from Medham, New Jersey. That's where Doubleday was. Medham? 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 I don't know. M-E-N-D-H-A-M? Yeah. Yeah, Medham. Medham? Yeah. Okay. Right by where I grew up. There we go. Uh, do you know where the Theosophical Society I've is? I've never heard of the Theosophical Society. Oh, I wonder if it's still there. So, so wait a second. Is this, you found this letter? I found this letter. So this Imagine is an exclusive? Me. Yeah. <laughs> this is disco exclusive? <laughs> Exclusive. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so this was dated uh, the 3rd of June, 1879, and he's writing to none other than Joshua Chamberlain, president Ooh. of Bowdoin College. And he writes, Dear Sir, in recounting former days upon the great field of Gettysburg, I've often pondered a great many questions, but maybe none so interesting as this one. Tell me, Professor... In your studies, if you come across a story from antiquity, two men <laughs> who are not the closest of friends, oh, enemies, this. you might say, and then one day find themselves facing each other on the field of battle, and they're both named Abner. <laughs> Very respectfully, your obedient servant, Abner W. <laughs> and so Chamberlain replies, Brunswick, Maine, 14th, August, 1879. Well, General... If the Greeks or Romans did not tell of it, I think that story must surely be in the Bible. Wow. Your humble servant. Wow. Jeff Daniels. Uh, Dr. Chamberlain. <laughs> Bowdoin College. That's crazy. So it that is. was actually taken from a conversation between... For those of you who don't know why we're astonished, that's a scene in the movie between Chamberlain and Hancock. And Hancock asked Chamberlain that question, not Abnu Doubleday. And by the way, uh, we have Abnu Doubleday and Abnu Pettwin in, in uh, <laughs> two Abners. Two Abnus. Uh, but no, so uh, so that's interesting. So that was, there's another, so the whole roll rocks down on you uh, scene with uh, Hood and Longstreet is taken from a letter that Hood wrote to Longstreet after the war. Yeah. Yeah. So and so that just goes to show, like Michael Shower really uh, not only did his research, but he was very creative in how he put the words uh, he took that people the words wrote at Doubleday, yeah, and, and put it in Hancock's mouth, exactly, yeah, yeah, and then and he took, but these are all from post-war letters and, and yeah. other things. And I, I found this one somewhere. That's fascinating. Yeah, where yeah. did you find that? Somewhere. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, go, I go somewhere a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't remember. You just like go down a, a wormhole. I and then just, you, yeah. I, I a found rabbit hole. You know, some dusty place. Yeah. 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 I don't find Did anything. we talk about um, Perrin's death at the Mule Shoe? Oh, we, we mentioned it. Well, we mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. Because there's ahead. a great oh, quote. Oh, so the, Balthazar just, has a question yeah. about that. Yeah, there's a great quote. question here. Yeah, he uh, said. Uh, so how did Perrin's death happen at the Mule Shoe at Spotsville? Yeah, so he's leading his Alabama brigade in there. And, and I think they're going to be at the East Angle area, not the West, yeah. if my memory serves me correct. But he's leading his Alabamians in there. And he says, um, I'm going to come out of this fight a, a um, major general, a live major general or a dead brigadier. <laughs> and uh, before, well, uh, within a few minutes, he was riddled he was with a right. bunch of bullets. Yeah. And, but he's on his horse. Brilliant. Yeah. And it's, you know, Sword the, drawn. the Union armies broke through. Yeah. And, you know. You know, I understand the, uh, what do you call it? Like the display uh, for the sake of your own men, that being on a horse in front of the lines, you know, with your sword drawn, and everything does. But like, you know, if you do it once and you survive, eh, I think that's enough, right? You don't need to keep doing it or do it more than once. I sort of think they do it without thinking. They just know they need to rally their men and they need to be seen and heard and they just do it without thinking. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you're right. Yeah. Like you, you find uh, they'd I think, be better off to think about it. I think we've well, I think, but I think everybody, even people who haven't been in the military or in battle, like everybody's been in some kind of situation where the the need to do something for someone else takes precedent over everything, and you put yourself at danger, and you don't in danger, and you don't realize just how bad it could have gone until afterwards when you can look back on it and you go, holy shit, like, well, I could have fallen off that thing. Or... And, he, and he did the very same thing on the first day. Yeah, he yeah that's, that's, what, that's what made me think that, yeah. yeah. 
I yeah. Mean, this was not an uncommon thing for a guy like him. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's a lot of... But, I mean, yeah, think it... I'm sure he did it at other battles, too. Yeah. And so to have survived all those and made it that far before you catch one, like, that's... It's that's that, you know, good. Doles dies around the same time. The two that are really underrated here yeah. both die. And who lives? O'Neill and Iverson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> That's a good point. And well, neither one of them went in. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to our patrons uh, for sending the questions in and and for their continued support, of course. Lewis, thank you as well for driving all the way up here from Virginia. Ben, thank you for contacting us and driving all the way down here from Michigan. My pleasure. Thank you. How far in Michigan are you? Uh, About eight, nine hours. That's not that bad. Yeah, you know, we come out here a lot. It's it's, uh, it's a great place. Yeah. You got to move here one day when you retire? You know... I've thought about it. Yeah. I, I think it would be a neat thing, but I you know, you gotta balance all the family stuff. But sure. certainly it's something that I have a passion about. Yeah. It's a cool place. And a lot of people it's a good place I, I haven't retired, but it seems like a good place to retire to because a lot of people do. But uh, you know, I think we have to be a little what's the word I'm looking for? Selective in who we allow in because you need lawyers. Well, we need lawyers. You got yeah. Veronica, even, but she's even probably retired overworked. lawyers, huh? You got Veronica, but she's probably overworked. Is Veronica a lawyer? She's a lawyer. Yeah, really. She's a uh, what a juvenile public juvenile public defender out okay. in Franklin County. Okay, she represents the heathens. Yeah, little heathens, <laughs> heathen juniors. <laughs> she's some of the stories I hear, man. She does, she doesn't tell me names or anything, but uh, well, I mean it's public record anyway. But yeah. she uh, or maybe. Would that be if it's juvenile? Probably not. Record? No, no, it wouldn't be. So yeah, but it's just you know in the abstract some of the offenses, and it's like wow, it's amazing what kids are up to these days. Mm-hmm. But I appreciate you uh, letting me come on here, Lewis. Thank you. Yeah, it's thank been you. A, a great, a great pleasure. Absolutely, I appreciate you uh, contacting us to uh, to come on. And I mean that's the thing. You just sent me an email, and you were like, hey, I did this, yeah. and uh, yeah. So that's fun to do that. So yeah, anybody else out there who's ever uh, accomplished anything, if you feel that you can sit in on an Ask a Guide, by all means, let us know and we'll uh, see if we can uh, work it out. Otherwise, that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank Thank you, you. ladies and gentlemen at home. Thank you, patrons. And we will talk to you next time. Goodbye. All righty. Hey everyone, before you go, I would like to highlight a friend and supporter of the show, The Badge Maker, your source for authentic Civil War Corps badges and more. Purchase handcrafted, historically accurate Civil War Corps badges from all Corps. Discover a vast collection of military and civilian insignias of various kinds. Experience the exclusive service of custom hand-stamped reproduction ID discs. At his website, CivilWarCorpsBadges.com, The Badge Maker brings history to life with precision and passion. Thanks for listening. Our hearts so stout have got a spade for suit is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead,